The Pacers get absolutely dusted by the Memphis Grizzlies once again for the second time in nine days. Going to break it all down. What went wrong for the Pacers? What's so tough about the Grizzlies? What happened in the game? And then I want to talk about Lance Stevenson, the, one of the few bright spots for the Pacers in this game, what he's doing well since the All-Star break. And Ricky Rubio is getting a segment today. Yes, he is still on the Pacers, but maybe not for long. And I want to talk about options with him all on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News, and today... We were talking Pacers-Grizzlies again, but it's basically the same Pacers-Grizzlies game I talked about on March 15th, 16th podcast because the Pacers got waxed by the Grizzlies by 30-plus points again for the second time in nine days. No John Morant, no Dylan Brooks, no Brandon Clark. No problem for Memphis. They dominated the Pacers start to finish. What went wrong for the Pacers? What can they do better? What can they learn from this game? We'll get to all that today, plus some newsy stuff from the game. And one guy who played well, Lance Stevenson. Talk about him, what he's doing well since the All-Star break, what it means for him, the future, what the Pacers can learn from the way he's playing well and what skills he's providing. At the end, we're talking about Ricky Rubio. Yes, he is still on the Pacers, but I just learned of a rule in the NBA that I did not know about that makes me think perhaps if the Pacers want to make a decision on Ricky Rubio's future with the team right now or any value he could have, they would make it in the next couple days. Very long intro, but let's jump right into Pacers Grizzlies where the Pacers get smoked, smoked again. 133-103 133-103 final score in Memphis. Look, Pacers on a back-to-back. They only had nine available guys. Brogdon rests again. I'll talk about that on a show next week. But that's three rest games in a row for Brogdon. I would not be surprised if we don't see him again this season. Jalen Smith is still sick. Goga's still banged up. Isaiah Jackson's still dealing with his head thing. Duarte's still out. Nine available Pacers on a back-to-back against the Grizzlies, who are absolutely rolling. And to add to the people being out mix. Rick Carlisle is out. Rick Carlisle out for personal reasons for the Pacers. He'll be out against Toronto this weekend as well. Lloyd Pierce detailing before the game that he's done with a family emergency. Hope everything's well with Rick Carlisle. But the Pacers were down a bunch of bodies. It's still no excuse. So were the Grizzlies, who are without John Moran, Dylan Brooks, a bunch of guys. But the Pacers got whacked again by Memphis, as they did in Banker's Life on March 15th. Final score is 133-103. And that means in the two Pacers games the Pacers played against Memphis in the last basically 10 days, 268-205 268-205 Grizzlies win. Wasn't even close. Pacers have no answers for this Grizzly team. They just attack the paint so relentlessly and finish all their drives with shots in a way that the Pacers just absolutely cannot handle them. Only, only air quotes, 54 points in the paint for the Grizzlies tonight, which is still a ton. They got a ton of production from their bench, and the Grizzlies hit a bunch of threes off of kickouts from their drives in this game. Steven Adams got nine offensive rebounds, and I, I wrote my notes before the last time these teams played – I think Steven Adams is going to have a bunch of offensive rebounds. Isaiah Jackson started at center that night, but he can't handle centers like that. And Goga, for all the great play he's been giving the Pacers recently, one of his warts is stronger center. Steven Adams is a stronger center. Completely dominated Goga on the glass. So the the Grizzlies get to the rim and score well, kick out of drives well, and have a center who just completely bullies the Pacers around the rim. That is a recipe for lots of high-quality possessions against the Pacers team with little rim protection right now, and really a little point of attack defense with so many decent defenders on the shelf that they just have no way of stopping Memphis. They scored 44 points in the first quarter. They had 10 threes in the first frame Memphis did. It was unbelievable how easy they made scoring look for the first 12 minutes of this game. They finished with 21 threes. That's a season high for the Grizzlies. Hit half of their threes. They barely turned it over again. 16 offensive rebounds. Everything the Grizzlies did was right. The Pacers looked horrible. Their defense looked absolutely horrible in this game. And they were led by Lloyd Pierce, who's normally their defensive coach. And I guess, in theory, that should matter, but... Their defense has been so bad this year. It clearly had no impact in this game. And, you know, I asked Lloyd Pierce about their defense after the game, and he's right. They've had so many guys in and out and have personnel issues right now that, you know, since the All-Star break, their defense should not be criticized to the point that it has all season, but their defense has been really awful all year. And and Pierce is leading that and leading dynamic coverages game to game. And, you know, Caitlin Cooper tweeted this a few days ago, but this is how I feel about the Pacers' defense right now in this game. Continue to expose it. Like, there's not a single common NBA action that you see on a given night that you'd be confident that the Pacers can stop it. Like with Turner on the floor, you you can be decently confident they'll disrupt pick and rolls pretty well or deter, 
you know, common cuts and things like that. And when they do a depot, they could blow up a bunch of dribble handoff stuff. Now it, it, it's very scarce that they can slow anything down. So the Grizzlies just got whatever they wanted from all over the floor. Indy native, Indiana native Desmond Bain was unbelievable. He had 30 points and only 15 shots and only took one free throw to do it. He was just drilling jumpers all over the floor. He was a plus 40. It was ridiculous how good the Grizzlies played. So let's talk about the Pacers since this is a Pacers show. It, it, Look, the defensive side was bad. The offensive side was just as bad. There was a point in this game where the Pacers were 3-for-25 from deep. Uh, they shot. They were shooting 40% after three quarters. Nobody could get the ball in the basket. Every starter shot under 45%. Halliburton shot the best percentage of any starter for the Pacers in this game, and he was 4-for-9. He had nine points and eight assists. An off night for him is a minus 33. The entire Pacers starting five was really off, so... You know, it's not like it's just his fault for that plus minus, but when you are the best player in the starting five with nine points, eight assists on four of nine shooting, it's a really off night for the whole group. Like Justin Anderson was okay on the glass. I suppose that was sort of redeeming, but he shot three for 10. O'Shea Brissett, another off shooting night. He was one for seven from deep and only had two rebounds and two assists. Gogo was three for eight. His defense struggled against Steven Adams. He got to the line for 11 free throw attempts and finished with 14 points. He was fine, but not good. Buddy Heald was five, had 11 points on 12 shots. Like all of the Pacers starters were bad. This this group got got smoked uh, earlier this week as well. Like without Isaiah Jackson, with starting Justin Anderson on the wing with no Brogdon, they are really struggling to get good production from the starting five. This unit has not fit together and has not been able to score. And this game was just another example of that. It's a very poor shooting group as well. You know, it seems like Heald and Halberton should be good. They only attempted three total three pointers between those two in this game and. Yeah, I, I would suppose statistically those guys are good shooters, and Hal Burton is a good shooter, but he was only shooting like 35% from deep with the Pacers, not even that high. So you know, they, they don't really have a ton of shooting in that group historically, even if Buddy Heald is taking guys out from the basket and open up spacing. That's great, but actually the percentages say the guys in the starting five, there's only one really good shooter in that group, and that's Tyrese Halbert. And they, they look like a team with not a lot of shooting tonight. That's for sure, as they were 9 of 33 as a team. Off the bench, Terry Taylor was very solid. Uh, 7 for 11, 17 points, 5 rebounds, 3 of them offensive. Going against Steven Adams, another offensive rebounding maestro. It was fun to see him do well. He drilled a corner 3 as well. He was one of two guys on the Pacers to shoot over 60%. The other being Lance Stevenson, who had one of, if not maybe, you know, and not actually not true. He had those games where he had a career high in assists and had the 20-point game off the bench in back-to-back nights that were both fantastic. But one of his best games of the season, not, not number one, the Utah and Brooklyn were both a tiny bit better. But Lance was phenomenal in this game. 25 points off the bench, hit 5 of 5 from deep. I believe that's a season high for him from beyond the arc. And he played almost half the game, 23 minutes, and they were only minus 3 in his minutes. That shows how good he was against the Grizzlies team that was rolling and how bad really the other Pacers were. But it was actually an impressive performance from Stevenson. 10 for 15, to, had two nice assists, really played a, a totally good game. He was probably the best Pacer in this game. I'll talk more about him afterwards and why I think – He's so effective for this team, but they really needed him to to put a stamp on this game. They needed somebody to step up, and he was the guy. His minutes actually went decently well, and him coming back of late has been helpful for a, a Pacer second unit that has struggled a ton this season. Lance's second consecutive game in double-figure scoring, and he had 11 assists the game before that against Portland. Kiefer Sykes played over 10 minutes, missed every shot he took. He's had a bunch of those games this year where he plays a lot and misses every shot. Dwayne Washington, two for eight. He's inconsistent, as he has been. All year, and that was the story of the Pacers game. You know, a lot of guys came in and just didn't do well. They did not fill their role well. And it was look, they were coming off a back to back. They were playing a team way better than them. That they, they had an emotional day yesterday, right? There's only eight games left in the season, and they know they're not going to make the playoffs. Like every factor again, they, they probably played their most emotional game of the season in terms of how much they would care about winning against the Kings. Maybe they will care about beating the Raptors for the Cavs pick purposes. But all that to say. Like, I, it makes sense that this was almost a hangover game for them, and they're a way worse team than the Grizzlies, even with the guys they had available. Their coach was gone. There are a million factors that point to, yeah, the Pacers were going to get smoked in this game, but they got embarrassed. I mean, there were moments of this game where they, they looked worse than they have all season. There were times when I thought this was going to be the worst loss the Pacers have had all season. I mean, they were down, I can't even remember, 35 points after three quarters. That's They, almost, they could have lost by 50 if they kept that trend going. They did end up scoring 32 in the fourth to redeem the night and make it not their worst loss of the season. But they just they got absolutely hammered. The biggest the Grizzlies lead got was 38, which would have been the Pacers' worst loss of the season. Their previous worst was to the Memphis Grizzlies. So just an embarrassing performance from the Pacers. And at this point in the season, this is who they are. They're not a good team. 
they're just trying to get to the finish line. And uh, clearly with the resting of Brogdon and, and things like that, yeah, there's some sort of lack of care for wins. And it's wins and lessons and not wins and losses for this team. Okay, yeah, I get all that. But the, getting embarrassed is not what this team needs to be doing as they try to build better habits going into next season. Same with, you know, blowing the end of close games like they did against Sacramento and things like that. So they need to whip it into shape, and playing Toronto is a good way to do that because Toronto comes at you all the time. The biggest Pacers loss since I've been covering the team was in Toronto when the Raptors just came at the Pacers and won by 40-something in Toronto a few years ago. So Pacers have a shot of redemption, but they've got to be better. They've got to be better. They've got to match. Ironically, Lance Stevenson's energy. He was very good in this game against the Grizzlies, their only redeeming player. I want to talk about him, what he's done since the All-Star break, what he's really done for this Pacers team this year, and what can be gleaned from his good play. Let's talk more about Lance Stevenson, who had a nice 25 points in this game. Before we do that, let's talk about the good folks over at betonline.ag. It's that time of year again. College basketball's tournament is finally upon us. And as I speak to you, Gonzaga has lost. I mean, it's been a crazy night for the NCAA tournament already. And and, uh, Arizona currently losing, which means my entire title game could be out by the morning. Who knows if Arizona ends up losing or not. But for the best way to get in on all the the latest odds, contests, and player props, betonline.net is the number one source of all the sports betting needs and info you could have. They remain the best spot for all your sports scores, sports podcasts, and sports news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head over to the website today or start you or use your mobile device to start learning more about the trends in the action over at BetOnline.net. BetOnline is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, go check out Locked On Grizzlies, where they're talking about a team that just clinched a playoff berth and completely rolled over the Pacers. They do a great job over on the Grizzly side of things, covering a very fun and good team. Lance Stevenson, great game for the Pacers tonight, 25 points. Again, only a minus two, or excuse me, minus three for him in a 30-point loss. They actually played okay in the half the game that he was on the floor. What keeps going on? Because since the All-Star break, the Pacers are awful. They have like five wins since the break. They have exactly five wins since the All-Star break. And yet, they are a plus four with Lance Stevenson on the court since the All-Star break. That includes this Memphis game where they just lost by 30. They have two 30-point losses in that stretch. And yeah, they smoked the doors off of Portland in that stretch too. They have more 30-point losses than 30-point wins. And yet, they're winning bench minutes with Lance Stevenson on the floor since the break. That blows my mind when I, when I was going through those stats today because... They, their bench has been horrible this season. The Pacers' bench has usually been something they can rely on and lean on. You know, the Justin Holiday, TJ McConnell, Doug McDermott units were awesome when Sabonis was in there. Those groups were great. And they had all those guys except McDermott were on the team at one point this year and playing. And yet the Pacers' bench was still just absolutely awful this season. And yet, with Lance on the floor, some of those same units that have been so terrible have been a plus since the All-Star break when the Pacers have been absolutely awful. And this Grizzlies game was another extension of that. What does he do so well? What does he what what is he giving the Pacers that that provides them such a positive? Like even if you go to the on off stats, Lance Stevenson since joining the Pacers in general this season, on court thirty two games right minus one point eight net rating. Now let's start there. That's a negative. That's bad, right? They're losing by two points per one hundred possessions with him in the game. Their offense is awesome, one thirteen point six offensive rating. Their defense is. Worse than the league levels at 115.4 defensive rating. So, And that kind of matches what you see with Lance this year. He has been wonderfully good on offense. Maybe his best passing stretch in the NBA since he joined the league. And maybe one of his worst defensive stretches since joining the NBA as he guards more lead ball handlers and his point of attack defense has not been very good with the Pacers. But anyway, minus 1.8 net rating in the 32 games he's played. In the 38 games the Pacers have played since he signed, because he missed six, due to injury... Minus 7.3 net rating with him sitting out for the Pacers this year. So when he, they are way better with him on than off, which is just wild to think about because in the past, those numbers have never been like that. One of my biggest criticisms of Lance forever is he didn't impact winning that much. Like even when he was on the Pacers the year that they were, they were really good with Vic and they almost beat LeBron in the first round uh, in 2017-18, their on, Lance's on-offs were terrible. Like they were way better with him on the bench than on the floor. Uh, And that was the case for him basically every season after he left the Pacers in 2013. This year is bucking that trend. They are much better with him on the floor than off the floor. And it's been fascinating to see him have that turnaround. And it's been fascinating to see, to me, 
And this game that he just played where he scored 25 points and hit five threes is a little different than this trend. But to me, a lot of that is he's been way more pass first this stint with the Pacers than he ever has uh, before. Or maybe not, you know, the year he almost was an all-star, 2013-14, it was, you know, a triple-double machine. Yeah, okay, that year he was pretty close to pass first. But he was 4.6 assists per game that season. And he played 35 minutes per game. With the Pacers this year, before this Grizzlies game, he was playing 19 minutes a game and has four assists a game. This is easily the best passing he's ever had. And an assist per 36 minutes, this is the most he's ever had with a specific team for any stretch of any season. By a lot. He only ever eclipsed six twice before. And they were both different stints with the Pacers, 2011, 2010, 2011, and then those six games at the end of 2016-17. So this is the best Lance's passing and the most effective his passing has ever been. His assist percentage is through the roof. And that is something that I think the Pacers have missed with their second unit. Look, TJ McConnell got hurt right at the beginning of December. And it's not, I don't want to say the Pacers season fell apart because TJ McConnell got hurt, but they had a really hard schedule in October and November. And they went 500 in November, and they were basically two one point losses away from going 500 in October. Now, 500 team is not a good basketball team. I'm not trying to say. They were good when TJ McConnell played, but they were much better when he played, when they had a pass first, create for other guys, threat with their second unit, and a guy who could drive into the paint and make plays. And Lance has kind of emphasized how important a guy in that role is and how much missing McConnell has hurt the Pacers. So Lance's passing has really exposed that they need more creating with their second unit, and he's been really helpful for them when he's on the floor. And McConnell will help a lot with that if he is on the team next year, should he return next year, and I, you know, I don't see why not then that would be a huge boon for them. But that Lance has kind of shown how important those roles are. A good passing lead guard with your second unit and to to springboard off of McConnell and Lance, Lance is really good at getting into the paint. Something I talked about on yesterday's show, driving is really important for the Pacers this year. Lance is one of the best at getting by anybody. He's got a good dribble package. He can get around the screen. He can get into the lane and make plays from there. He's finished pretty well this season, especially compared to past stints with the Pacers, right? From zero to three feet, 71.7% prior to this Memphis game where he just shot extremely well. That would be the second one, second best season of his career behind 2016-17, right? He is finishing very well at the basket and passing well. And those two skills are obviously important, but that makes him an effective driver in a way that the Pacers need him to be and kind of shows if they had TJ McConnell for much more this season, they definitely would not be a team that is at the record they're at now at looking like they're going to be one of the five or six worst teams and probably have the worst Pacers season since the 1980s. If they lose in Toronto this weekend, they'll be 25 and 50. Yet Lance Stevenson is still having a positive impact for the bench. So what can we glean from this? What does it mean for Lance? And I don't want to get into Lance free agency stuff. I don't want to get into too much free agency stuff now. I think that that's a good offseason topics with the offseason coming up in, in, frankly, just about two weeks now from today. It'll be offseason time for the Pacers. But we what we can learn is, you know, rim attackers are just so valuable. Guys who can get into the paint and make plays are so valuable. And Lance is really good at that as a backup guard. And so having the, that role as a backup point guard is so important because, remember, the first year of the Kevin Pritchard era, their backup point guard was Corey Joseph. And Corey Joseph is good. I liked Corey Joseph. And him and Victor Oladipo were an awesome pairing, especially defensively. But their offense of the second unit that season was not very good because they had a lead guard in Corey Joseph who wasn't that great at blowing by guys and getting into the paint and making plays. When they got McConnell in the door and they could shuffle Corey Joseph's role around or he, he wasn't even on the team anymore, suddenly the second unit became miles better. And this is not about Lance anymore. This is about those two guys. But Lance is really emphasizing those points. What I think the Pacers need from their second unit point guard, and Halliburton's really good at all these things as a starter, and Brogdon's good at these things, but they haven't been with the second unit that much. And Kiefer Sykes is not very good at these things. And Brad Wanamaker was terrible at these things earlier this season. They need a second unit ball handler who can get in the paint and make plays. And if that means next season they bring Lance back to have that role on their team, that makes all the sense in the world to me. If McConnell comes back next year and maybe they draft a point guard or something, or they still have Halbert, maybe they trade Brogdon, they need point guard depth behind McConnell, and they want to keep Lance in that role, that that makes sense to me too. But what he has kind of shown as he's played well since the All-Star break and really all season for the Pacers who have played better with him in the game than off is that they need more of those guys who can get into the lane and make plays in their second unit because their second unit has a lot of good specialty guys this year, but not a lot of good initiators. And that was really exposed when McConnell got hurt. And that continues to shine through now as a bunch of guys are injured. And (laughs) quite frankly, their second unit guys, even if 
they were healthy, would be a lot more play finisher type and less initiator for others type, right? Like Chris Duarte is definitely a finisher. O'Shea Brissett with their healthy team would be the second unit. Same thing. Any center on the team is a play finisher. Dwayne Washington's the only maybe initiator you'd consider with this group, but he's definitely more finish his own plays and create for others. You know, in general, it's a lot of finish. Kiefer Sykes is a better shooter than initiator. Uh, Jalen Smith is a better finisher for sure than initiator, right? All, all of them. So the Pacers, maybe it's Lance, maybe it's someone else. We'll get into his free agency again in the offseason. Same with McConnell's offseason. We'll talk all about it in a couple weeks. But we've learned from Lance and his success, especially in this game, how important it is for guys who can get into the teeth of the defense and make plays, how valuable they are to the Pacers. And he really shows how much they've been missing McConnell all season and how important those skills are. And maybe he can be that depth guard for the Pacers next year, even if he's not in the rotation like he has been for so much of this season for the banged up Indiana Pacers. Speaking of reserve guards, Ricky Rubio is on the Pacers. Can you believe it? I've never talked about his name hardly at all. I talked about him being in Spain after he talked to Rick Carlisle the day he was traded to the Pacers, and that's it. That's pretty much all I've heard about Ricky Rubio all season. He's collecting checks and rehabbing, and it was a trade the Pacers should absolutely have made for Karis LeVert, but Ricky Rubio is doing nothing for him. Should they cut him? What is the pros and cons of doing so? And why do I think now is the time to talk about potentially just cutting ties with Ricky Rubio right now? We'll get to that after we talk about two awesome groups of people. And first up is the good people over at NBA Top Shot who are making the officially licensed NFT of the NBA. You can connect with a community of hundreds of thousands of NBA fans as a natural progression of fantasy sports and a way to upgrade your experience as an NBA fan with NBA Top Shot. The future of what being an NBA fan looks like, it's part trading cards, there's a bunch of moments on there that you can trade and, and sell like a stock. It's like the stock market. Every day, millions of dollars worth of NFTs are traded. It's kind of like fantasy sports and that every night you can capitalize on the market. And it's kind of like an airline loyalty program for the NBA. Some collectors have, for example, flown out to Game 5 of the Finals last year. They flew guys out for rookie moments and stuff like that. They got to have dinner with first-round picks, including playing basketball with Obi Toppin and Tyrese Halliburton. Speaking of Halliburton, he, Pacers guard, is an investor in Top Shot, as is Michael Jordan, Kevin Durant, and Will Smith. People ask all the time, why would I buy a highlight when I can just watch it on YouTube? It's not about watching the highlight, but having an ownership stake in what's akin to a stock, but it's an NBA highlight. If you were to tell someone in 1916 that a piece of cardboard with Babe Ruth's face on it would be worth millions one day, everyone would think you're crazy. That is the idea with the Top Shot NFTs as well. It's being part of that cutting edge of the digital age. If you sign up for Top Shot today, the best way to start is by getting yourself a starter pack. You can pull an NFT of a superstar like LeBron or KD or your favorite rookies for just $9 as you start. Top Shot moments can be a great way to access events and use for mini games on a regular basis. NBA Top Shot is the future of being an NBA fan. Own officially licensed rare NFTs of the greatest moments in NBA history. Sign up today at lockdown.nbatopshot.com. Let's also talk about Built Bar, who are making the best tasting protein bars ever. I'm not just saying that. I mean, I've tried a bunch of the flavors. I love all of them. Both of my listeners have tried a bunch of flavors and tell me on Twitter that they absolutely love them. What are they? They're protein bars, like I said, that taste like candy bars, 100% covered in chocolate, super soft and easy to chew, great meal replacements because they're really healthy, great snacks because they're not very big, which is a compliment, not an insult, because most of their macros are fantastic for the health conscious person. Now, most of them are 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. You'll be blown away by how good something so healthy is. And they're way better than those crappy protein bars you get in the store. You got to try them today, especially my favorite flavor, the coconut, excuse me, the peanut butter brownie. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That promo code again is LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Thank you again for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every day for your second one. Go check out Lockdown Now here about every game in the NBA last night from the local experts on the Lockdown Podcast Network, including yours truly, talking about the Pacers getting smoked by the Memphis Grizzlies. Let's talk about Ricky Rubio for maybe the last time ever. Why do I think now is a good time to talk about Ricky Rubio? So Ricky Rubio is not going to play for the Pacers this year. He tore his ACL in December. He's in Spain rehabbing. He's not, he wasn't in the team photo last week. He's just on the payroll. That's it. So the reason I want to talk about this now is what the Pacers – so the reason he's still with the Pacers right now, they haven't just cut him, is because there's no reason for Ricky Rubio to do what Tristan Thompson did and agree to a buyout because he can't sign on their team. No one's going to sign Ricky Rubio who's injured to a contract on their team. So the Pacers are stuck with him for now. And, again, it was the right trade to deal LeVert for him. They got some good assets for Karis LeVert in that trade. He was just the matching salary. But – 
if they cut Rubio, they could open a roster spot. And here's why that's important to talk about right now. So there's this rule that I didn't even know existed. The Rockets just signed Anthony Lamb to a two-way contract, and it's what got me to dig in and find these rules. But you have to sign a two-way contract player for at least 15 days. He has to be on your team for 15 days during a regular season to be able to be eligible to be a restricted free agent and in the offseason. If they're on your team for less than 15 days during the season, or at least on your active list for 15 days, then you can't make them a restricted free agent. And a lot of the pro of converting Terry Taylor or Dwayne Washington's contract for the Pacers is they could backfill that two-way spot, try someone else out for the rest of the season, and then if they like him, keep him easily on a restricted deal. And there's about to be less than 15 days left this season for that strategy to be possible. 15 days left starts on Sunday. There would be 15, the, the, the season ends on April 10th, and on the 27th, there would be 15 days left in the NBA regular season. So if the Pacers want to do that, if they want to convert, if they want to maximize the value of converting Terry Taylor or Dwayne Washington's contracts and then backfilling it with another two-way, they would have to do it by this Sunday. And that the reason I, I think Rubio is involved or could be a player in this is Justin Anderson signed to a 10-day. And so what they like his 10-day expires on that day. So it is possible the Pacers just say, screw it, Justin Anderson's off the team. We'll backfill that spot with a two-way and then do all those things I just said. What they could also do though is just cut Ricky Rubio and then convert a two-way and keep Justin Anderson or convert both two-way guys and then backfill those with two new two-way guys and get more young talent on a team that is desperate for young talent. And I think that has more value than Ricky Rubio does on the team, which is why I think it's interesting to talk about now because after Sunday, and don't get me wrong, there would still be value in waving Ricky Rubio past Sunday, and I'll talk about one reason they could wait. But the reason you do it now is to have those flexibility options and to be able to evaluate more guys and to potentially keep them in restricted free agency if they pop for your franchise. And they would lose that flexibility in three days. So it would not stun me if the Pacers wave Ricky Rubio in the coming days just to take advantage of that rule. I did not know that was a rule because usually the deadline to sign two eight guys during the season is January 15th, but that rule is gone in these COVID seasons so that teams can field rosters easily. So it's a, it's a unique rule, but the Pacers, you know, the Rockets just took advantage of it by getting Anthony Lamb. The Heat just cut Kyle Guy and signed Michael Mulder to a two-way deal today. That also inspired me to, to continue to look into this rule. So it would not surprise me, you know, the Heat made a move today. The Rockets made a move this week if the Pacers follow suit and cut Ricky Rubio to open another roster spot. Now, again, Justin Anderson's 10-day expiring could be a way for them to open that spot, but that is what I think is another layer to this is Rubio's doing nothing for the Pacers right now. Now, another reason the Pacers could be keeping Ricky Rubio on the books is that in this offseason, they'll have his full bird rights, which means they can, if they stay over the cap, if they decide to do that, they could re-sign him. And maybe they don't want to do that. In fact, if they draft another guard or they still have Halberton and Heald and Brogdon and McConnell and maybe they re-sign Stevenson, they definitely would not want Ricky Rubio. But, but, there are only about five teams that could have cap space this summer. And if the Pacers decide to operate over the cap, there could only be four. That means... Other teams getting Ricky Rubio could be pretty hard, and it could require a sign-and-trade. And that's where the Pacers could swoop in is, hey, we have his bird rights. We'll sign-and-trade you Ricky Rubio. The problem is I don't know if Ricky Rubio is going to be worth more than the mid-level exception, which is a team that every a tool that every team has, even ones over the cap. So it's possible that he has no value from a sign-and-trade perspective. And if that's the case, then the Pacers should definitely be cutting Ricky Rubio by Sunday. But if he does have some sign-and-trade value, then the Pacers could keep him into the offseason and use him in that way. And that's smart. That's a reason to keep him. And that's probably why he hasn't been cut yet. But as, as this goes on and you think about, you know, is he really going to be worth more than the MLE coming off of an ACL tear at his age? I don't know. And if he's not, the Pacers should definitely, I think, part ways with him soon. It, they'd have to front the whole bill, but they, they could still have more roster flexibility and more bites at the apple with young players if they decide to move on from Rubio now as opposed to waiting of a few weeks or something like that. So Ricky Rubio, maybe he lasts the whole season with, with the Pacers on their cap sheet, even though he's not on the team or with the team. He, he's on the team technically, but not with the team. But if they're going to move on from him, it seems like it would happen in the next couple days. So if it does happen, that's why you heard it on the show. Now, there is one player who makes some of this a little confusing. So the rule says that a player, to be able to be converted to a restricted free agent, uh, has to be on an NBA team's inactive list or active list for 15 
or more days of the NBA regular season and the last season of his two-way contract. I, it doesn't say consecutive days. So I wonder if Nate Hinton, who was on the Pacers for 10 days on a hardship deal earlier this season, if those 10 days count. Shout out to Scott McNeil, who I was talking to about this, for helping me think about that. Because then, if those days count, the Pacers could convert Terry Taylor or Dwayne Washington to the full roster and then sign Nate Hinton to a 10-day with only about five days left in the season and make him restricted if they like how he is. And Rick Carlisle does like Nate Hinton. He's talked highly of him in his two stints with the Pacers during preseason and during COVID hardship exception. So he would be a guy that you could wait 10 more days technically, if that's how the rule works to cut Rubio for. But if the Pacers do want to maximize their flexibility or if they want to keep Justin Anderson and keep that flexibility, it would not stun me to see the Pacers cut Ricky Rubio. But the cleanest way could just be let Anderson's deal expire, convert the two, convert a two-way, sign another one, and then see what you got the rest of the season. Depends what they feel about Justin Anderson. He's got one more game to really prove what he can do with this Pacers team. After a really good start last weekend, he's had two rough games in a row. So we'll see a lot of moving parts, but I think now is the time to talk about Rubio's deal with the team because there's a, a deadline coming up that actually could incentivize the Pacers to decide to move on from him. Hope everybody had a great week and enjoyed watching the Pacers play basketball games. I'm sure that you know as they keep losing, they're losing some interest from you all, but I, I, I say these games are still fun and interesting seeing these young guys grow and get better and, and learn how to be a team together despite getting smoked by the Grizzlies. I'm still really enjoying all these games and this new team and, and watching them grow and get better. And we'll continue to break it all down next week. We'll talk Raptors who the Pacers play this weekend. Of course, we'll do standings watch on Monday. And they whatever decision they make with Justin Anderson over the weekend as his 10-day expires will, of course, be worth talking about on Monday. So it'll be a great show. We'll have a lot to do next week as well. Hope everybody has a great weekend, and we will see you then.